Welcome to Classics Confidential. I'm in Cambridge today talking to Professor Paul Cartledge about his new book, Democracy, A Life. And I thought I'd start by asking him about the title, because that's quite an intriguing way of describing it, a life. Why not a history? I have to be very honest and say it was not my first choice. <laughs> but, but I was happy to go along with it, because what I am looking at is a concept as well as a practice. So democracy is both an idea and a thing. And I'm looking at it over a very long period of time, which is sort of like a life. Mm. And so if democracy has a life, where was it born? It was born, both the word and the thing, in Athens, uh, round about 500 BC, before Christ or before the Common Era. And it was born there because of developments which had occurred within the previous century or so. They'd had um, a real crisis, economic and political, which had been solved in a very interesting way by a man called Solon. And actually later Athenians looked back to him as the founding father of democracy. Not actually true, but he's a kind of the mythical founder. But about a century later, another crisis involving actually occupation by a foreign power and the decision was taken that uh, ordinary people should uh, actually have a say. And if you like, we have an earlier form of democracy and then a more developed form of democracy. So primitive democracy comes into being at Athens around about 500 BC. Hmm. So the, the man who's sort of the protagonist of the cover, that's not Solon, is it? Who's it is that? not. That is Pericles, and uh, he's being painted there on the Pnyx Hill, which is just below the Acropolis, which you can see in the background, painted by a German painter, middle of the 19th century. Greece had freed itself from the Ottoman Empire, but very quickly the great powers had imposed a monarchy, in fact a Bavarian, southern German monarchy. So there were quite a lot of Germans in the court, including um, Otto, who was the king, his um, winemaker and beer maker. So Philip von Foltz Pericles, thought then to be probably the most, if you like, distinguished practising politician, and the 5th century BC was then thought to be a much better, greater period than the later democracy. I actually challenge that view in my book. And this image that we've got on the cover, obviously it's a later reception, a recreation of what democracy was like, but how accurate is it? Does it would democracy have looked anything like that in Athens? Well, there is um, a primary sense in which um, democracy happened. Uh, it was effective through mass meeting. And one very snappy definition of ancient democracy is government by mass meeting, which is just the sort of thing we either can't do, because it's not possible to get us all together, mm. or we don't think we should, because we don't think snap decisions are the way to make um, major decisions. But the ancient Athenians were a primary, direct democratic society society and all adult male citizens that of course excludes women it excludes unfree it excludes resident foreigners about maybe 30 to 40,000 in principle but of them up to 7 8,000 might actually come and sit on the Pnyx Hill every well every month at that time so 10 to 12 times a year at least mm. The, this idea of the masses and everybody contributing to a decision, it does make me wonder about the modern age and technologies like Twitter. And you do yeah, touch yeah, on Twitter yeah. towards the end of the yeah. book. So I was uh, hoping to ask you about what you think the role of digital social yeah. media might be in, in modern democracy. Is it something that can bring us back to a more collaborative way of thinking? It is yeah. in principle. In other words, the technique is there. But what I think is missing today and was very important then is culture. In other words, education. And Pericles is famously said to have said that Athens was an education for all Greece. Some people take that to be for all the world. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the point is that um, ordinary Athenians were from very young age aware that one day they would actually be deciding by majority vote in public, raising the right hand, um, what the city was going to do. So both laws and um, pragmatic decisions about um, do we make an alliance with so-and-so, do we go to war with so-and-so. So we today, we're brought up with a system where it's always at a distance. The government is them. We're not the government. They were the government. So we don't yet, at any rate, educate our potential citizens sufficiently, I think, to be able to take decisions of that nature. However, we are currently in the middle of a referendum, which is the equivalent 
of an ancient Athenian assembly meeting. So um, I'm actually very wary of um, resorting to referenda in our system. Yeah. I mean, I'm in favour of it in the sense that, as a citizen, I like to have a say. But I wasn't asked whether I wanted a referendum. Mm. Now, I, I think <laughs> I know the answer to this from looking at the book, but do you, do you wish that our political system was more like the ancient democracy? Yes and no. In other words, um, on a day-to-day basis, at least at the local level, I think it would be good if we were more able, more frequently, to actually decide, let's say, we've got a certain budget, should we spend it on health or should we spend it on roads? I mean, it's a simple thing like that. As it is, we vote for a council and the council makes decisions like that, whether the county council or the city council. So I'm in favour in principle, but nationally, because we live in a global world, and if you make a decision um, of any sort, apparently at government level, it has mega impact, um, for example, financially, on, let's say, the market in um, sterling. I mean, it's terrifying, the thought, that um, what the impact of our referendum is going to be uh, in June. It's just uh, very much, in other words, to trust the people, which I would like to do, to make the decisions, um, nevertheless, is such a tricky thing in its not just mechanism, but its outcome. Mm. Now, in the book, between... So we've talked about the birth of democracy and then the possible... Well, not the death so much, but democracy in its current incarnations. Yeah. In between, there's an awful lot going on, isn't there? So could you just give us a couple of... High, actually, I was, I was hoping that you'd focus on the moment that intersects with your own personal biography, mm. which is this... Um, well, you tell me about Putney. Yes. Well, there is a very long hiatus, shall we put it that way. Um, in a sense, ancient Greek democracy in its primary form, that is, mass meetings, any uh, citizen who's qualified turns up, that's the state's decision. That ended round about 300 BC. And for a combination of reasons, people who didn't like it, internally, the Romans conquered Greece, they didn't like primary democracy, they had a form of popular decision-making, but not democratic in a Greek sense. Well, then there's a very long period. The word itself goes down, it comes to mean something like riot in the Byzantine world. And it's not until the 17th century, following the Renaissance, that there is a notion that the people whoever they are, mm. should be uh, allowed a say, and let alone a decisive say. So we're in a world of monarchy, fundamentally, of aristocracy, of privilege of birth, not achievement, not ordinary people having us until. And um, our own country was um, among the first to have a major political revolution, middle of the 17th century, with the regicide actually killing a king, which is a fantastic step today, justified. And there's a huge literature, Milton and others contributing. And the personal connection is that there was a series of debates actually during the Civil War in late 1647, presided over by Oliver Cromwell. And the view was put forward that actually the poorest he, one person said, should have as much say as the richest he. He noticed, not she. But nevertheless, um, of course, this is much later in my life, I suddenly realised I'd been brought up ah, right. in this place. It's a church in <laughs> Mary's Putney where these fundamental steps were first taken. That's so nice that you were brought up in that, well, hot spot of democracy. It was, and then in, spend, in yeah. retrospect. Now, in I the, mean, yeah. when we say democracy, again, um, it's not yet called that. The, the levellers and others are talking about republics, that is, not monarchies. But the word democracy doesn't rise again, doesn't come to be accepted as the norm or even the ideal, really until the 19th century. And then there's a debate. Now, I'm an ancient historian, so I say, well, just how democratic, in an ancient Greek sense, is any modern, representative, liberal, rights-based democracy? Well, any ancient Greek coming back today in a time machine would say, you've got oligarchy, mate, you don't have mm. what we understood by democracy. But there were are different types of democracy in antiquity there as were, well, right? Yeah, 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 various levels, various grades, mm. and uh, Aristotle, the great theorist of ancient Greek politics, wrote a work, um, his many lecture notes, called Politics, and he distinguished four types or grades, subdivisions of democracy, ranging from the most extreme, where the assembly meets, that it takes a decision, that's the law, that's the decision, or where you have 
a primary pre-deliberative council which acts on behalf of its sort of like representation but still it's uh, the people and then there are various grades even less if you like uh, mm. radically democratic mm. if i may ask you one more question um i was very interested in this comment you made towards the end of the book about religion and the growing mm. um i suppose move away from the secularization of politics yeah. that we've seen over history um post-antique history could you say a bit more about that? What do you think yeah. the relation is today and then also in the past? It's a very tricky question, but um, part of what's called the Enlightenment, the 17th, 18th century notion that you separate that which is personal, private, as it were, between you and God, uh, or gods, whoever your God mm. is, and politics, which is um, not in itself religious, though it might have religious um, features. That uh, development would be very alien to an ancient Greek, for whom everything is full of gods, as one of them put it. So there's no, there can't be any radical separation. But the ancient Greeks' type of religion is not the same as a, a monotheistic, revealed religion. And therefore, it's much easier for an ancient Greek, though he's a believer, though the gods are everywhere, to actually determine what the gods are supposed to do. And whereas um, in a monotheistic system, God is all-powerful, and you have to relate to God and carry out his, normally his will. So the trend since the 17th century has been a gradual separation of church and state. But my feeling is that that has been somewhat undermined more recently, especially in other countries. I'm think, talking about the Middle East, of course, but mm. the impact upon that uh, of the events uh, elsewhere on our culture is such that I'm a little concerned that um, religious notions are more and more affecting, or they sometimes anti a particular religion's notion. I'm talking about people who don't like certain types of Islam creeping back into politics in a way that I find a, a little disturbing. Mm. And what about the future of democracy? What would you like to see happen? Well, paradoxically, what's going on at the moment, the American uh, presidential uh, primaries and so on, is actually a surfeit of democracy. Greece has had referendum. Um, Switzerland regularly has referenda. We are having one on the EU. So in a sense, that's probably as far, given we're not really very well educated, in my opinion, about politics, most people, mm -hmm. I think that's probably as far as I'm happy for it to go. Right Eventually, yeah. I would like it to move further towards um, a proper education in politics and also making people feel that they have a say and a stake uh, because they're citizens and therefore they should be educated to be Democrats in a conscious sense. Well, I think you're doing a great job of <laughs> taking us towards that. And I certainly feel a lot better educated about democracy than I was before I read the book. So it's a very good moment for it to come out, isn't it? it Given is. everything that's happening in the Quite UK at the moment. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica, very much for having me.